Well, good morning, everyone in OBTS, Level College. It is such a privilege to be here this morning, uh, to be able to preach in this place, a place that I call home, where I get to teach, where I get to live. Um, I'm so grateful uh, for uh, just to be a part of this family. I'm grateful that Emily Rose, my sweet wife is here. Amos, my oldest son is here. Hi, Amos. Uh, our youngest son, Ezra, who's almost two, who might be the cutest and loudest little individual to have ever lived is not here. Uh, he is with the babysitter, likely giving one of the Ray girls all she can handle right now. But I'm, I'm so privileged to be able to present the scriptures to you this morning in this place on this week. So thank you all for your hospitality to me and my family these past two years. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to serve and teach and be here. But I'll move on because I will get uncomfortably emotional for how kind and receptive you have been to me and my family. And everybody knows Charlie Ray does not like me getting emotional. So we'll move along. Uh, let, let's get to it for a minute. Um, let's think about the idea of time this morning to begin thinking about time. And when we think about time, I don't wanna think about it in the ways we normally talk about it, uh, which has to do with time management. Don't waste your time. You need to prioritize your time better. You've probably heard that or thought that or felt that these last few days, these last few weeks. That's not really what I'm talking about. Um, we don't need today any life hacks. We don't need to be better versions of ourselves. We're not computers and we're not projects. There's something altogether different that's at stake here. So we don't need to use thin language for a thin view of God and his work in this world. Today, when I think about time, I want us to think about the, the broad scope of God and this world. So we can think about it in a number of ways. Uh, these are uh, ways that people have thought about time for generations. First for us is past tense. What God did in and through Jesus Christ, his son, death, burial, and resurrection some 2000 years ago, that is past tense for us. But then we have present, present tense, who we are today as followers, those who choose to follow, those who have been uh, recipients of God's grace and follow the risen Lord. That's present tense actively today in this moment. But then of course there's future of what God is doing, will do in the coming days. So the return of Jesus, the resurrection and the new heavens and new earth. Time is, is working in all of those ways, but it meets us in this very moment. It meets us in this week. And that's really my concern is how do all those things work in this week? This, whole this is Holy Tuesday. We're moving to Friday, which we call good. And we're moving to Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. And I'm concerned with how we think about time in these spaces in this week. So the way I want to do that is have you turn to the book of Isaiah. Turn to Isaiah chapter 42. As we do so, I want us to not just recall facts like so many of my students would or will later this semester to recall facts and then forget them soon thereafter. We don't need to recall things of the past simply as a point of study. But my call, my aim, my hope here is to give us a reading that prepares us for Friday to give us a reading that prepares us for Sunday. Because the Easter story, the, the broad scope of it is one that is completely entangled in our sin. And today I just wanna work on one little thread and briefly so, one little thread of that story because the full story, it's full richness of the Easter story cannot be told without Isaiah 42. For generations, those who follow Jesus return to this text this week. And all I want us to do is to hear it once more, but not just to recall past facts, but to engage mind, body, and soul with what God has been doing and will do. So as we meet Friday and as we meet Sunday, this is not a normal week, 
but it is a week that we think and feel and have recall over who God is and who we are in light of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that's what I hope to do. I hope to do it in brief. Uh, So if you have Isaiah 42 in front of you, I need to give at least a running start on this. So Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, which many of you know, is a prophet that is preaching and ministering to all of Israel. The Northern Kingdom will be thrown, uh, overthrown and destroyed uh, during his ministry. And he will preach and prophesy the destruction and restoration of the Southern Kingdom. As we're thinking about Isaiah 1, and that's really where I'll live just for a moment to set us up. Isaiah 1, which a number of my Old Testament students uh, can attest to, they could do it better than I can, I I assure you, that in Isaiah 1, you see who God is and who Israel is. God says, I have raised and reared sons, but they have rebelled against me. That's verse 2. Verse 3 of chapter 1, just as a setup, there's a great poem, but it's a poem of indictment. It's a lovely bit about animals. So an ox knows its owner and a donkey its master's crib where it gets its food. But Israel does not know and my people do not understand. So this little setup there is trying to show that Israel has less sense and less wherewithal than some of the least intelligent animals in agriculture. That's how bad off they are. Their sin, their iniquity, their blindness to themselves, their blindness to who God is, is uh, prevalent among them. So then you get various images. Israel in chapter one is like a body, a sick, ailing, frail body that is in desperate need of healing. Israel is like Sodom and Gomorrah. And not just that, the words get even sharper. They are Sodom and Gomorrah. These nations that never knew God, that were judged because of their actions in the book of Genesis, that's what Israel is like. But it goes on. Israel performs their sacrifices over and over again. They do what they think they should do. They do the rituals, the sacrifices, they make their sounds, but to no avail because they think that the machinery of it is all that matters. But God calls the prophet Isaiah and tells them, bring justice, particularly to the widow and to the orphan. Those have been marginalized within their society. But that's not all of chapter one. There's there's notes, there's hints, there's breadcrumbs of something to come that God will wash them, that God will turn their sin whiter than snow. When, how, the details, not present, but just hints, just an opening here to what is sometimes called the fifth gospel. So Isaiah goes on to say much through the rest of the book that would be worth our hours and hours of study. But I assure you, I do not have hours today. So I'll keep my comments brief and turn to Isaiah 42. So let's read that together and then we'll make some comments. Isaiah 42, beginning in verse one. Look now, my servant, I grasp him. My chosen one, my life takes pleasure in. I've placed my spirit upon him, justice to the nations he will bring out. He will not cry out nor raise a voice. He will not cause his voice to be heard outside. A bent reed he will not break and a colorless wick he will not extinguish. Truly, he will bring out justice. He will not be inexpressive. He will not run until he sets justice in the land. And to his instructions, coastlands will wait. Thus, the God, the Lord has spoken, creator of the heavens, the one who stretched them out, the one who spread out the land and its offspring, the one who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to the ones who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will hold tight your hand and I will keep you and make you a covenant as for the people, a light to the nations. To open the eyes of the blind, to bring out from the prison, the prisoner, from the house of imprisonment, the ones dwelling in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. And my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to idols. Former things look, 
they have come and new things I am telling before they sprout up, I will make you hear. Here we have a text called a servant song of a nameless servant and a vision of the kingdom. So what I only want to do today is just draw your attention to a few of the beautiful details that cause us to think about who God is and what God is doing. The vision of God and servant and how that is completely wrapped up and tangled in the story of our sin, the story of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. So let's begin in verse one. We note here a few things that this servant is indeed God's servant and he is God's chosen one. This is the one whom God holds, whom he grasps. That's who the servant is. And much more than that, it's the one in whom God takes pleasure in. So whatever we see about this nameless servant, we see that he is one that God delights in and one that will go and do the work of God. Especially note the next line in verse one, I have set my spirit upon him and here is the purpose. So we get the who, we get a little bit of the what, here's the purpose. Justice he will bring out to nations. Now God was always at work in Israel, his chosen people. But going back to Genesis, this work in the covenant of Abraham was meant to be as a blessing for all peoples. All the nations, all the families of the earth will be blessed in and through, through Israel, through the sons of Abraham. Part of that story is being told here that this one, this servant will bring out justice, will make all things right. That is good news. This servant will make all things right for the nations, for those around outside of Israel. But what is this servant like? What is his disposition? There's much to see here, uh, but just a few notes. Verse two, he will not cry out. He will not raise his voice. Here, the, the, the words ring out from Isaiah five, this famous vineyard passage in which Israel is like the vineyard and God is, is, is like the one who tends to it, even the owner himself. And he comes and he looks for grapes, but the grapes are just sour grapes. And then we pull out of the, of the analogy for a moment. And then God puts it quite plainly. Israel, I've looked, I've looked for justice and I've looked for mercy in Isaiah 5. But behold, only bloodshed and crying out. Israel has cried out in the worst of ways. Here the servant though, the servant will not cry out. A gentle disposition, but one who is bringing justice. He will not raise his voice, nor will he make his voice heard outside. What else is the servant like? A bent reed he will not break. This, this idea, this bent reed is, a, is an image that occurs a number of times in the prophets, but often this bent has more of an idea of oppression, one that, it, that is oppressed, that is beaten up, but this servant will not break it. He will hold on. And even more so this colorless wick, this wick that's almost out, he will not extinguish. He is gentle, he is patient. So whether this is to only Israel or all the nations or both, it remains unsaid, but something is repeated once more. The end of verse three, truly he will bring out justice as if we need it repeated again. He will bring out justice and he will not be inexpressive, verse four. He will not run. This sense of inexpressive, this is typically made use of eyes. So kings, when they're old, it would say their eyes are inexpressive, meaning they're about to die, they can't see, those kinds of things. Ah, but this one, this servant, this nameless servant who has the spirit of the Lord upon him, he himself, his full person will not be inexpressive, meaning he will be alert. Not only will he have vision, but he will be alert to the task at hand. What's more, the next line, he will not run. He will not run away from the task at hand. He will stay steady to it. This servant is, is, has the disposition of patience and gentleness, but is one who will fulfill the task. Till what point though? To the point that the text shows us. Until he sets, once again, we have to see it, till he sets justice 
in the land, perhaps even in the earth, in all the earth. The earth is waiting for justice. The earth is waiting for things to be made right. How does that work? How does that happen? This text gives us a thread of an answer. By this servant, that's how. It doesn't answer all the other questions because that's not the point. The question answered here is, what will happen with the earth and all its sin and all its iniquity? The servant speaks to it. And not just bringing justice, but somehow that is tied together with the next line. Coastlands, they will wait, but they will wait in particular for his instruction, the instruction of the servant. So these coastlands, a favorite word of Isaiah, these non-Israel, these far off, they will wait for the instruction of the servant. He will bring justice and he will bring instruction. That is good news to a people that, that have seen so much, so much egregious sin, so much iniquity that somehow the servant is bringing an answer. Verse five sets it up, thus the God of the Lord has said, and here we get into creation language. Prophets use creation language all the time. Typically, prophets use creation language to front in or, or close out a word of judgment. But here that's not how it's used. Let's get a few things here at first. God is creator of the heavens. He stretched them out. He spread out the land and its offspring. He gives breath to the people and spirit to the ones who walk on the earth. Verse six, I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. Now, what will the Lord do for this servant? I will hold you tightly by the hand. I will protect you. So part of the creation language is to state for the servant and for all who listen and read that the domain of God is the entire world. He created it, it is his. And the particular edge of that is that he has authority and power over it and in it. So as he sends the servant to bring justice, as he sends the, the servant to instruct and teach, he, this is happening in God's domain. So as that happens, God will protect the servant. God will care for the servant. God will hold him tightly by the hand and God will make him a covenant as to the people. And here's where it all starts to unfold, a light to the nations. Light in scripture is so often nearly synonymous with salvation, deliverance, purity, cleansing. So something that is happening is not happening just in Israel. It is happening through Israel and it's moving to the nations. Hopefully you can hear the book of Acts a bit in the back of your mind. This is happening among the nations and the servant is being light to the nations. So the, the good news, the salvation, the deliverance for these peoples is being brought by and embodied by the servant. And that gets more specific as scripture almost always does when lines stack on top of each other. The next verse. So this is done to open the eyes of the blind. Notice the, the play on the visual. So the servant will be a light to the nations. Well, what are these people like? They are blind people, but their eyes will be opened by the servant. He will bring out the prisoner from prison, from the house of imprisonment, the ones who are what? Dwelling in darkness. So, so people who have only known darkness, who cannot see, who cannot understand, who have not experienced, who have not tasted the goodness of God and his salvation and his deliverance. The darkness is only known. This servant brings an answer. The servant brings an answer to them. And let it be known, verse eight, that I am the Lord, that is my name. The Lord is not one of many gods. The Lord is not in any real competition with other gods. The Lord, his living name, his name, his divine name, that's his name, Yahweh, the Lord. And let it be known that his glory, he will not give, he will not exchange it to another. The next line reads, 
nor will his praise be given over to idols. Israel was prone to just carve stuff up, wood, metals, all these kinds of things to make and mold images and worship them because they could see other people doing it. And sometimes it went okay for them. So they did it. And there's a long history of this going way back into Exodus. It never goes well for Israel when they do that. There's very specific instructions not to do that. But yet they still did. It is a perennial struggle to worship the things seen. Here though, God will not, this is not just okay to God of nice try, but let me clarify some things for you. It's not that moment. God does not exchange his glory to another and God does not let his praise go to some carved image. That is not who God is. He is the living God, he's the true God and he sent the servant to bring light, to bring justice, to bring instruction. So in this we hear once again, verse nine, former things they surely have come, new things I'm telling you, but before they sprout up, I will cause you to hear. So in this time, as we think about Friday, a good Friday, that story is told in light of this. Somehow this servant, somehow this message, and of course we know how, but somehow this servant is the one who will die. This servant who is a light, this servant who brings salvation, this servant whose instructions are brought to the nations in and through Israel, this happens by the servant. And we see this text. So as we move forward to Friday, as we consider who we are, not just past facts, but in light of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, in light of us following him this present moment, in light of the new heavens and new earth, the resurrection to come, in light of all of those things, let's re-engage with the truth of scripture. Let God make this scripture at home in our hearts, that we hear it and re-engage with it, mind, body, and soul, that we don't just rehearse some religious ideas, that we are in and a part of the story in which God has brought redemption. And this story of redemption is told at least one thread of it through the story of a servant. So in OBTS and Level College, this is what I hope you can think on. Let, let the scripture linger on in your hearts and minds. So I'm gonna pray for us and then we'll be dismissed. Let's pray together, please. Heavenly Father, you are good and you are merciful. You are a kind and loving God who has demonstrated patience to us and those long before us. We are recipients of your grace and we are indebted to your mercy. As we uh, go through today and all the things that we have, as we proclaim your name, as we live out the evidence of our faith in you, the living God, help us in these ways. Help us to consider anew, to remember afresh the Easter story, that it may not be rote or mere facts from history, that the historical truth of what you have done in this world meets us this very day, this very week. May you grab us by the heart, may you awaken us to who you are. May the scriptures dwell richly in us, that we may recall you, that we may worship you, and that we may praise you, because praise is due to no other but you. So help us in all these things. Bless the work and the study and the service and everything in between that goes on in and through the people on this campus. I ask this in the holy name of Jesus by way of your spirit, amen. All right, you're dismissed, thank you.